through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Jump it back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows ekphrastic. I get drastic. Hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Hello, I'm Spencer and this is the MacGuffin. Today I'm joined by the director of True Wolf, Rob Whitehair. This is the story of two people who raised a wolf, introduced it to children and people around the world and sort of tried to try to expand people's understanding of wolves and what they are naturally like. It's, it's a really interesting story. How exactly did you become aware of it? Because as far as I could tell from the, the little end credits where they said how old the wolves were and stuff, it began in the 90s. Was this something you had been around, aware of for a while and just decide after the fact to come back and tell the story? Or what exactly brought you to it? Because it's not like something that's happening right now. Yeah, exactly. All the time that this was going on, I had been making other films. And I I think I, I had heard about Kiwani, but they were always gone. They were always on the road. So, you know, we lived like 40, 50 miles away. Oh, so you were you're from Montana then? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you you are very familiar with this uh, little ongoing situation, right? Um, and you know, I didn't know that Bruce was, you know, taking all this footage. As a matter of fact, when I really learned about this subject, he approached me hmm. after having had numerous filmmakers. Um, he had tried to work with numerous filmmakers on this. And the main issue that he was having is that, you know, every, every, like filmmakers do, they want to put their own stamp on it. Mm. And his feeling was that the story in and of itself of just what they did with this wolf was enough, that we didn't have to go any further than that. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think the, I mean, the footage that you have is pretty incredible to consider how much documenting they must have been doing just on their own. It was one of those interesting stories. Right from the beginning, you set the tone with that um, classic footage that he talks about of, and this is Bruce, was it Weedby? Whitey. Whitey. Um, that he talks about about seeing that black wolf shot and killed. And you actually, I mean, cut to the footage. And it's so sort of horrific to watch, uh, at least it was for me. I mean, how did you sort of and this is an overarching point, how do you sort of set a tone? Because, you know, documentaries are one of those things that it's so easy to skew in one direction or the other. And I'm sure there are any number of, like, people trying to push you in one direction or the other. How, how did you sort of, you know, keep it to its own little piece of art and sort of just tell the story as a story and let people decide for themselves what it is yeah see that's 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 kind of where when bruce came to me and told me the story it immediately clicked in my head this this right here is a chance to tell the story of wolf i'd always wanted to do a wolf film hmm. and um you know from the time i actually moved to montana 15 years ago i was kind of looking for this kind of quintessential way of of telling a wolf film. It's something unique that hasn't been done before. Sure. Um, and, you know, this was it. I mean, it was like a dream come true. Bruce shows up, he tells me the story, and, you know, this life that they lived with this wolf, and I thought, well, this is perfect. This is a way, through an intimate story, and having a wolf connected with people, and their whole idea of what they wanted to do was if you put a wolf in front of people's eyes, is that going to change you? If you can look a wolf in the eye, is that going to change you in any way? Um, it's definitely an interesting thing to watch. I mean, what kind of preconceptions did you have going in? I, I grew up in New Mexico, which is fairly, you know, rural for the most part. I, I live like next to a river. We had bears and stuff walk up on our lawn a couple times. And... You know, generally I'm a pretty animal friendly person. Like I like I like animals as much as most people. And so innately I'm, you know, pro wolf. I want them out there and whatnot. And then yet still in the back of my mind there are like those scenes that you had where the the Kuani would go up to like the kids and lick their face and stuff like that. And I'm thinking like 
I, I, I totally would love to pet that wolf, and at the same time, I'd be terrified that it would bite me in the face, because, you know, it is a wild animal, ultimately. So how, how, what were your preconceived notions going into the film about wolves, and how did they evolve after you watched all this footage that they had accrued over the years? Yeah, yeah, that's a really, really good question. So I had done a lot of filming of, of wild wolves, mm. and so you always see them out, you know, in the wilderness and you know through studying I was a you know wildlife ecologist and had studied wolf behavior and and knowing that they're this highly social animal but when you're watching this footage and you know there's just a ton ton of footage that I had to go through with this I think the thing that really comes out is you don't realize just how much they're like us socially mm. until you see this and the way that Kawani interacts, I mean, there's, it's not an animal that we can control no more than we can, you know, control people, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very much after what, when you watch the footage, you definitely get the impression that control it is not the uh, approach to take. <laughs> exactly. Um, and so I think this, this kind of um, window into this world where you see how just how social and how like humans they can be. It's it's funny you say, you know, they're social like humans. If anything, I kind of feel like they're more social than humans because when Kawani was left alone, uh, she, he, she, she would go crazy and like start tearing things apart. And that, I mean, I definitely know that with my own dogs over time. But I know a lot of people who are completely fine being alone and so it's sort of like it's even more so than humans that there's really that sort of pack mentality existing yeah that's that's very true i mean you know I, one of the things pat says in the movie that i think is really funny is that you know here's this animal that is not a primate i mean we're a primate we want to touch and feel and hug and you know constantly be doing things with our hands and that's not how they do things i mean mm. you know a wolf signals with its tail with its ears and you know its mouth and so when you see an animal that's licking you know a <laughs> face i mean yes it's a wolf <laughs> and that that you know i think does make people uncomfortable you I, know to see it well, it's but. just it's that wild aspect at least for me you know i don't get me wrong like if it would lick my face i'd probably be totally on board with that but there's like those scenes where it's on the couch and they're like get off time to go to bed and it's like snarling at her and then i'm looking at this like four-year-old girl and it just walks up and licks her face it's sort of like this is such an unpredictable animal that it's yeah. it's I, I appreciate that they're going to the schools to introduce it to kids because i think that's an important thing to even more beyond just wolves respect nature in general but at the same time, in the back of my mind, I'm wondering how much of a risk is it? Say they go to 100 schools. This is why I was telling my friend after watching this movie. You go to 100 schools, you slam dunk, knock it out of the park. Every kid's like, yay, I love wolves. But that 101st school, it bites someone, you're screwed. Like instantly, yes. that is the only story that's coming out of it. Yeah. So were they conscious of that risk in bringing it to schools? Because it seems like it could have dramatically undercut what they're trying to do if something went wrong. I mean, a hundred kids, I'd freak out around a hundred kids. I can't understand how a wolf can maintain composure. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I tell you, you know, it, it, it's one of the things I respect the most about Bruce and Pat and how, how they treated this whole situation. You know, understanding number one, you can't, you know, a wolf is not a dog. So that's the first thing. Um, you can't domesticate it. So you, it is a wild animal. It doesn't have the ability to learn mm -hmm. those behaviors that dogs do. I mean, they're bred out, you know, of generations. Any, of generations yes, exactly. Out, yeah. So they they knew this risk, and the the idea was how do you strike this balance where you're going to bring a wolf into a situation like this. And, you know, try and, and do this without, you know, kind of minimizing the, the risk. And that was one of the, one, the little things I wanted to see if you could clear up for me. It, I mean, the beginning part where they sort of get the wolf was a little bit um, confusing to me. 
a producer approaches them about what what a why did the producer approach them do they have some sort of pre-existing knowledge of wolves that was really noteworthy because it, it seemed weird that this producer's like i want to make a movie a movie with wolves here's a wolf deal right, with this right. and i was just like why on earth would they pick these people out of yeah. the blue seemingly and sort of so pat was a um she had graduated um uh, in grad, uh, graduate school um, and was a wolf biologist for the okay. National Wildlife Federation. <laughs> See, now that makes a lot of yes. sense, then, yeah. And so, and she kind of illustrated that a little bit in in the film where she says, "I was working as a as a uh, biologist for the National Wildlife mm, Federation, okay. doing educational programs, because the the issue at the time was wolves were naturally coming back down into the far north mm. of Montana, and so her task basically was to go in, you know kind of research people's opinion, public opinion okay, and to and to talk to people about what that's going to mean if wolves are naturally repopulating and and so and it was only in this very small area um, up on the west side of Glacier National Park so this filmmaker who had these wolves bred to for this film mm. Um, an so the wolves were already there. They're like, they're like, here, this this bomb is already out there. Deal with it. Sort so, of. so what happened was that they they had bred the wolves. They knew they were going to have these, you know, these pups. And he saw her at a presentation mm. and went up to her and asked, you know, would you be interested in this? And so he basically said, I want a, I want to do a, a scene of. If you're willing to socialize this animal for six months, I want to do a scene of uh, ambassador animal in a classroom. And so that's how it happened. It was the intention was, I mean, they're like everybody else. It's this whole idea of like all of us, we have our dreams in life that we want to, you know, Bruce graduated in, in uh, creative writing, got his uh, MFA in creative writing, and they're going to have this great life. And then they're like, well, this is great. It's six months. We can do this, and then, you know, we'll get some money, pay off some bills, and then like live our life. Well, it's such like a Hollywood idea, though, isn't it? That they're just <laughs> yeah. like, we're just gonna get a baby wolf and just like get someone to deal with it, and then you know, after that, whatever, you know, it'll go back to nature or something. Like the complete short-sightedness of the whole project is kind of amazing. And I mean, I guess conceptually, it's good that that person wanted to introduce wolves to you know people since I guess he was the one before Bruce and Pat sort of pushing the idea. Right. But the interesting thing is, you know, obviously wolves don't live six months and they end up taking this wolf for, I think it was like 16 or 17 years. Their identities became so wrapped up in it. And Pat even talks about that at the end of the movie. Like, d did you get a lot of discussion with them about that? Because their entire existence basically for those 16 years was around the wolves like you know they lived with them all the time they traveled with them they toured them that was their job like yeah. how how that process was in essentially making that their lives yeah like, what was that like for them it, you know i think that, that was one of the toughest things that they had to go through is to to come to the conclusion that they were going to have to severely change their whole existence and and the other part of that too which is interesting to, to to bring up is that it's one thing to say that well okay now we have this wolf and we're gonna have to take care of this wolf mm -hmm. but then over that time period that you've committed to it you know in say the first year to understand that not only do we have to take care of this wolf now but we can't make it live the life that we want it to live mm -hmm. we're going to have to now live the life that it wants us to live and i was just amazed that like they could make that a life honestly i'm, I'm glad yeah. that schools were that willing to bring them <laughs> in and have them demonstrate but i was i was just amazed 16 or 17 years with that being your living seems like a really tough thing because if that didn't pan out what do you do? Like, I don't, I don't know where you go at that point. I mean, yeah. I guess you'd have to put the wolf down or something, but like, yeah. I'm, I'm grateful that it lived a full life. And it's really interesting to sort of see the preconceptions and different perspectives of, of wolves that you show in the film. Like you show some people who are vehemently 
opposed to wolves, and there are some people who are really strongly in favor of them. What was that like balancing that sort of like, I, guess, I mean, you talk about it in the movie, the deity versus demon sort of um, perspectives of wolves in terms of how much you wanted to really go into that versus how much you want to just keep it on the story of Kiwani and, yeah. you know, because those, those are those are two things you could easily make movies into themselves, you know, people's perceptions of wolves and the story of Kiwani. How yes. did you sort of decide how you're going to balance those two topics? Yeah, see, that's <clears throat> that's one of the interesting things when we were really kind of at the, at the very beginning of this of this process. I mean, you know, spending 16 years with a wolf being a storyteller as Bruce is he he kind of knew this the points that had come out over this time period mm. it's a long time 16 years yeah. and so many presentations and thousands of people and so you really kind of understand these universal themes that people are talking about when you go to so many places and you hear the same thing over and over again <laughs> and so it was yeah. interesting that the, then it became how do you translate those larger themes into this film mm. and do it in a way that you kind of try and keep an even hand, mm -hmm. even gotcha. keel on it. And that was a that was a huge task on it because, you know, there's it's pretty easy to stack the deck. Oh, totally. Especially, especially um, I mean, given that you're working with Bruce and Pat, I mean, you could have easily just been like, this is going to be the most pro-wolf movie ever. Like, they right. had a wolf. It was awesome. End of story. Right, right. And, and, yet, and yet you guys decided, I mean, them included, to be like, look, there are people out there that hate wolves. Like, hate. They want to kill them. They don't want them around. Like, they don't even want to discuss it. Like, d what was their perspective about that? Do, do they feel, you know, freedom of speech? You know, everyone needs a voice? Or... Do they understand where those people are coming from as well, you know, living in Montana and whatnot? Yeah. I think the thing is that what 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 Bruce and Pat did and what really the whole idea of this this film is about is if we can cut through these stories that we've told ourselves for all these years, and so many of them are just based upon fiction, mm -hmm. you know, Little Red Riding Hood and all yeah, these that things. Yeah, that was a great part when you were sort of going through the sort of like mythos of how wolves had become mm -hmm. perceived as evil demons, basically. Yeah. And you see that a lot of times in these places where if you can get to the point where, you know, you put a wolf in front of somebody and you say, okay, here's the facts about the wolf. And you see it's not you know, slavering all over the floor and wanting to kill you. <laughs> and yet at the same time, it's not this, you know, not always this presentation of this most majestic animal. It's, it's sometimes it looks, you know, well, it's, it's, I mean, I don't know if you want, what you want to call it, ironic or just serendipitous or poor time or whatever. But I mean, even just this year, the gray came out and I'm sure you've probably <laughs> been asked about the gray or whatever. What, I mean, do you do you look at something like that coming out and just being like that is the exact opposite card from what we're doing, or do you? I mean, how do you balance the sort of idea of perceptions versus wolves versus you know people understanding fiction versus them just anything believing anything they see? Like, how do you sort of get people, or how do you basically feel about people's? understands of wolves based purely on entertainment perspectives yeah. like yeah. that is really what people see mostly yeah it's really true i mean when the gray came out it was it was interesting because in, in part we're kind of like well this is kind of perfect timing because it's coming out and it's it's kind of illustrating exactly you know what we're trying to get at here is that our we we do tell these stories and we leave it up to people to you know, kind of come up with their own conclusions. But the, is the issue that you have then is that when you tell the story that's not truthful about the way that wolves really are, then you have people who are going to formulate opinions about what, what they think wolves are instead of what they really are. And in some ways, I actually think the gray might be even more dangerous because, you know, Little Red Riding Hood, I'm pretty sure people aren't going to expect to see a talking wolf. But, 
the gray, they actually portray wolves as wolves, except like a extremely aggressive, violent version of them, mm-hmm. which I mean, you'd think you would hope people be like, okay, this is a Liam Neeson film, this is fiction, right. but yet people seem to take that kind of stuff to be true. Yeah, it just proliferates the myth, yeah. and and I think that's what we're trying to cut through, and the idea that, you know, we have to understand where our stories come from, and if we want to understand the wolf, if we want to understand how to live with the wolf and coexist with it, that we need to come to what the truth of it is. And this is this is an animal that is it has to kill to eat. It's going to do that. And you know, the thing is, it's going to kill an occasional cattle and sheep. It's going to do that. And we have to understand that on both sides of the equation in order to understand how we can manage this. It's a really sort of American or patriotic perspective that we are the ones who want to, like, close the market on killing cows or something like that. Like, no, nope, that's our business. Like, you get none of that. Right. <laughs> but the other thing that, even beyond the sort of the going for against wolves, the other thing that really is a, an important theme in the movie is the captivity versus freedom one that you talk about in regards to Kalani. And I mean, even Bruce and Pat sort of vacillate on how they feel, you know, like, look, we love this experience that we have with Kalani, but at the same time, we kind of feel pretty bad about having to have this wolf in our, in our environment and having to have it adapt to us. What, what, I mean, where do you sort of come down on this after going through all this footage, talking to all these people? Because I honestly am unsure how I feel about that. In some ways, you know, I respect that it would have been killed anyway. It did a lot of good in introducing wolves to kids and whatnot. But at the same time, it fundamentally is a wild animal. And I feel kind of shitty for it that it had to live in a house for 16 or 17 years what, where, where do you guys come down on yeah, this that's I, I feel the same I mean it and I think that you know it did it did um, you know Kawani did a, amazing work it was not Kawani's choice to do this it you know it served as an ambassador for its you know the, the wild species but but you know I think it's one of the things also that really endeared me to the story was this is not advocating for having wolves as pets or keeping them, you know, um, outside of what their true nature is, and that's to be wild. And so in doing this, in part, it was kind of an exploration for me of this, this is a kind of exploring what, this, what, it, what does it really mean to be wild. And in doing so, I tell you that the, the twist that I like to talk about is in this entire process, I think what I ended up learning more was what it means to be human. Interesting. And, and, and that really struck me. One of the things I'd imagine would be sort of a problem in terms of, you know, introducing wolves to kids and general people and whatnot is that there's a very big difference, as we said, between dogs and wolves. And, you know, it isn't necessarily what they are shooting for in terms of like, um, or I mean, they, they want to introduce the concept of wolves, but there's there's a fundamental like people look at a wolf and be like, oh, that that's like a dog. Do you think there's any problem that could stem from people becoming too familiarized with wolves in the sense that, you know, it becomes something like, oh, it is like a dog. Like I could have a wolf. Do you think that that additional exposure might have increased people's interest because they were able to do it. They were able to live in a life yeah. where this was essentially a pet for them. I think in part, and that's what we wanted to do in, in with this particular film, to leave this legacy, that they don't make pets no. at all. And I think we kind of illustrate that in, in the film. It, this is not some animal that you can just like say, hey, I, you know, No, and I agree. You guys, sit. you gave a much broader <laughs> picture, but sort of like you think about their tours of schools and stuff where yes. sort of like little kids who get to pet the big the big doggy and it's sort of like mm-hmm. do you think people like that then grow up to be like wow that was a great experience with that wolf like maybe I should get one of those you know you know I think there's always going to be that I think they really tried in their message 
in in what they did when they went to schools. That was always something that was at the top of the message was to say they do not make good pets. This is not a dog, and it never will be a dog. It can't learn how to be a dog. This is a wild animal. It's a wolf. It doesn't belong in captivity. I, I certainly hope that. I mean, if anything, that would be awful if even more wolves were then brought into homes. Yeah. But the other thing I want to talk about is the style in which you made the film. It's it's really interesting to me in terms of documentary filmmaking. Um, number one, you know, the use of reenactments. That's pretty uncommon. I know like James Marsh, the guy who did Man on Wire, does yes. reenactments. But for the most part, it's fairly uncommon. Uh, you guys used a lot of music throughout the movie. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's not a pro or a con. It's just it was an interesting thing to notice that there was a lot of music used throughout. Uh, you did you did a few things that were intense to watch, like the black wolf being killed in the beginning and the decaying of Kawani's skeleton in the end. How did you go about you know deciding stylistically how you're going to make this film? Because you guys really. It was a documentary at its core, but you guys ventured outside of that box a lot in terms of the way you made the film. And I think that definitely makes it stand out in terms of documentaries, but at the same time, it, it's not a traditional documentary and people might perceive it differently because of that. I don't know. I mean, yeah, it was a risk. Definitely. I appreciate you, you know, having all those comments about it because it, 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 so they were all conscious, you know, decisions. To make in it and one of the things stylistically that i really was trying to do you know through showing these certain you know harder to watch scenes that's what that's what wild is i mean nature's cruel it's not always this great thing, you know, that we just go out and no, nothing happens, nothing dies. <laughs> to be fair, that black wolf one was more of humans being cruel, oh, nature absolutely. being cruel. But yeah. I'll give you the decaying skeleton. That was much more <laughs> natural. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, and also, you know, it's this is this is what people do to them. And I mean, how how you know, if you just can show it and put it in perspective, as in, you know, the idea with that very specifically was to really drive home the point that Bruce in his very early years was influenced by media that he watched oh yeah and so w without showing it I don't think it would have the same impact as as you know you show exactly what he saw and then have him say well I mean that's interesting because you, know, you know you show what he saw you hear what him talking about, and then you cut to the reenactment where he's like, nope, not going to kill the wolf. So it was sort of like an interesting perspective of all different sorts of types of you know, filmmaking all within that one five-minute span there. But yeah, it's, it's a fun film, very interesting. I hope people definitely check it out and learn more about wolves. The film is True Wolf. Uh, where can people find out more information? You know, if it's coming to a town near them or a festival sure, or whatever. Sure, sure. Uh, so uh, we have a website. Um, and that's truewolfmovie.com. True um, we also have a uh, Facebook um, that. page, and um, that's uh, True Wolf, um, Kawani and her unusual pack. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Twitter, of like course, Twitter. and that's at True Wolf Movie. Awesome. Um, and, and then um, we are opening. Um, the film has been picked up. Oh, fantastic. Um, which is fantastic. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Shadow Distribution um, is a fantastic uh, boutique distributor of independent films out of, uh, out of Waterville, Maine. Um, one of the biggest films that they had um, distributed was The Wild Parrots of Telegraph Hill. Wow. Um, great film there as well. And so, uh, you know, Ken Eisen, just a, a great, great person, um, loves this film. And uh, so he picked it up and we are opening um, June 22nd for the wow. National Theatrical Release. This is all happening very soon. Yes, um, here in Seattle um, right. at the Landmark Varsity Theater. Good theater, yeah. And then it will roll out uh, nationwide from there. Okay, that that's pretty spectacular. Hopefully people will be able to check it out very soon then. Uh, in terms of you, what other projects do you have coming up that you might want to mention? Or is there a place where people can keep up to date on what you're working on? Sure. or 
get in touch with you, Twitters or whatnot. Yes, yes, absolutely. So I have a website. I have two websites. We have our treeandsky.com um, website, which is our production company, myself and my wife and producing partner, Pam Voth. Um, and then robwhitehair.com is kind of my own, nice and you know, straightforward. Yes, yeah. nice and straightforward. <laughs> um, and, you know, I kind of go into a little more, you know, blogging and, you know, talking about the stuff I'm, I'm going to be doing. Um, I'm working on a mountain lion project right now um, based in uh, California and various places over the West. Wow. And the whole idea with that is, you know, kind of how do you connect to an animal? that you're never going to see and you know it's one thing you're going to see wolves you'll see grizzly bears you'll see, you can see those readily but you'll never see a mountain lion I don't, wolves are pretty skittish too in my experience <laughs> like they do not like to be seen um right. that sounds awesome yeah and then a grizzly bear film which is set um, on the border of uh the u.s and canada and um the whole idea of that is you know this population of grizzly bears is living in um essentially the same ecosystem separated by four sovereign territories hmm. each governed differently wow you know each with different management plans that's crazy yeah and how how do we as humans deal with that and how do, are we ever expected to conserve you know an animal like the grizzly bear when there are all these different plans mm. Interesting. That sounds, uh, both of those sound really cool. I definitely look forward to checking both those out. So thank you so much, Rob, for joining me. Thank you. And you, you. can uh, see more Appreciate interviews it. at MacGuffinPodcast.com. Magneto can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Magneto can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. It's tight. Don't even try to buy the sign. Mr. Spock can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Mr. Spock can't stop me. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Borg can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels all right.